folks, we are here with Dr. Joel Sneed, who is a very special guest. Um, Joel has actually written a number of chess books. Um, I think the famous one that a lot of people know, Lessons with a Grandmaster, um, that he co-wrote with uh, Grandmaster Boris Golko. Um, but today we're going to be talking about uh, Joel's new book, um, also co-written co with uh, Grandmaster Golko, which is Analyzing the Chess Mind, um, which is all about psychology in, in chess. Um, I should note Joel is also a uh, professor uh, of psychology at Queens College and a practicing uh, clinical, excuse me, cl <laughs> sorry, you said cl it. Clinical psychologist. Clinical psychologist. Thank you so much. Uh, with uh, with patients that, that you help in, in their uh, regular uh, life. So I'm super uh, interested to talk about psychology and chess because I think there's just so many um, fascinating topics here. Um, first of all, how are you? How was, how was the experience of writing the book? Uh, well, all of the um, books that I wrote with Boris were a lot of fun to write. Uh, I learned a ton and, you know, um the, the the analyzing the chess mind um we stayed with the same um format that we used with lessons with the grandmaster so you know basically it's each you know piece of it is is a is is me sitting with boris um and you know going over some either a, a game as in lessons with the grandmaster they were all like complete games or in analyzing the chess mind, there were some complete games, some some chess, you know, game fragments and stuff like that. But basically the same kind of thing. We would do what we're doing here sometimes, or you know, we do like a Zoom session or something, and and we would do a couple, usually a couple of hours, uh, a couple of times a week. And uh yeah, it's, it's it's you know, you learn a lot, I think. Yeah, I mean the the book looks super interesting. I honestly can't wait to read it. Um, we'll have a link for people in, in the show notes and the podcast notes, and there's a link in the, the Twitch chat as well um, for people to check it out. Um, but yeah, just looking at the, the table of contents, um, it's just got all kinds of very, very interesting uh, topics related to psychology and chess, um, like uh, problems in self-confidence, aggression, uh, mind reading, uh, losing winning positions. Uh, I can talk about that all day. Um, time management. So a lot of super, super interesting uh, topics. Um, I'm not sure where exactly to start, but what do you think are like, let's say the biggest psychological problems that, that most players are dealing with? I'll just tell you a story. At losing winning positions, I had to fight with Boris. Oh, really? <laughs> I was like, that's the most important thing that is out there you know like i mean I, yeah. I i i you know how many positions i lose that i'm completely winning in and uh and he was like oh it's it's just technique and you know why is that interesting and then so then then but then he thought about it some more and said okay we'll we'll, we'll do a chapter on on it but he was didn't think it was so interesting at first but i I guess it happens less at, at their level, so, but I've seen it happen. I mean, that famous game between uh, Nakamura and Carlson, right? Like that was a pretty mm -hmm. famous game where Nakamura was completely winning, right? And 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 kind of fell apart and lost. Yeah. No, I remember that one. No, it happens yeah. all the time. Um, I, yeah. I've done it uh, plenty. Or I should say, for me, it's more common that I I blow a winning position. Um, and end up in a draw. It could be like a simple tactical thing, or it's just like an end game that I kind of slowly, um, slowly uh, lose the grip on. And it, yeah, it's always felt psychological to me. It's like I know I'm very close to the win, and because of that, it's like I just automatically relax. Is that is that what you found? It's just like you just can't, can't yeah, seem well, Boris, to, to close yeah, it out. Yeah, I mean, Boris talks about that, and he, he says that there there's a completely different psychological experience for the person that's losing and the person that's winning. <laughs> the person right. that's losing is on guard. They're like, I'm looking for every trick, every trap. Maybe he'll screw up this way, that way, whatever. You know, I'm I'm fighting. I'm a, I'm a dog in a corner. I'm a caged animal, and you know, I'm gonna sacrifice some crazy thing and and just 
bring every piece of, you know, there's caution to the wind, I'm out for blood, you know, and you're just like, yeah, you know, completely winning. Oh, and then you start to imagine yourself on the podium with the trophy, you know, you're like looking up your rating afterwards. <laughs> and it's just like, you know, it's a completely different psychological experience. And, uh, you know, you relax and you lose you just completely lose composure and you lose the thread of the game and you just it's it's unbelievable you just make one stupid move after another <laughs> yeah like why, why can't i make a normal move yeah <laughs> yeah i uh, know i mean it, so many so, times well there are there any strategies that can help because i'm i've been aware of this issue at least for for myself for a while now even during the games i might be consciously aware like okay i'm winning now i need to like double down focus and and make sure I, I close it off but even then i'll often still blow it anyway so yeah how do how does someone try and approach this yeah i i mean i think what i remember uh i, I haven't read the book in a long time now but what i remember was um the what he thought you know this um kind of fantasy that you're you know you're you you relax and you start to think that you won the game and you start to imagine yourself like you know winning the tournament or something like that or winning the game or you know uh you know even some if you really really think about it you know you think like what are the images and fantasies that show up and um you know i i you know, I remember one game I was shaking the opponent's hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, and I remember like just so sort of like trying to kind of shock myself out of that. It's like, what are you, wait a minute, like I'm winning, but he hasn't resigned, <laughs> yeah. you know, and uh, but that's the that's the fantasy that that happens, you know, and um, so um, yeah, I think exactly what you were saying is. Uh, uh, is the strategy to really, really kind of double down and completely focus on 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 your next move, one move at a time, right? Yeah, I'm I'm often thinking about dinner or lunch, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, thankfully it's, That's it's because become... you're a chess professional. <laughs> <laughs> it's become a trigger for me. Once I started thinking about food, I'm like, wait, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> this is right. a danger danger zone i try to like let's try to refocus but um but that's like you know tough. i mean isn't that like goes back to one of the central um tenets of of the chess dojo and the chess dojo training program which is analyzing your games right yeah. and um that training program with eight hundred thousand games that you have to play and analyze to get to the next level and, um, um, you know, if you're doing it right, and I'm, I'm, I haven't at all, but I think that would be one of the things you would learn is you would become sensitive to that kind of thinking process if you went over your games and did that even a handful of times. You'd be like, okay, you know what, when I start thinking about Subway and <laughs> what kind of dressing I'm going to put on my salad, right? Yeah. It's it's time for me to to take a walk, get some, you know, get, shake myself up, try to figure out a way to get my head back into the game for the next move. And I think that's a big part of of, of the psychology of learning about yourself. And um, so you know, we have different different avenues to get to that. I, I wish I had gotten to it from studying my own games, but um, instead I was in psychoanalysis for five years. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so I, I get a different avenue to it, but. Yeah, so is yeah. that similar? Is you, you guys also have a chapter on aggression. Um, is that similar to players kind of being overconfident when they're playing like a lower rated player? Uh, like you just kind of expect to win. And so you just don't just somewhat somehow mentally, you just don't uh, put in your, your greatest effort as when you're facing someone that you think is, is stronger than you. 
Yeah, I don't remember off the top of my head, but that's certainly the the phenomena, right? That you uh, you you uh, you know, strong strong player makes a move, and you start to think, uh, you know, where what's the trick? What's the trap? Where's the tactic? What's the idea? Weak player makes a move, and you just go, "What well, doesn't that just hang a piece?" <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, it's just totally different. <laughs> right? Yeah, for sure. No, yeah, but I think that's sort of the experience, uh, the uh, the experience of of expectations. You know, um, and I asked Boris about that. You know, I said, uh, I. You know, I think there's. A, I, I'd like to try to get rid of those expectations somehow. Playing stronger players, playing weaker players. I do much. I have a, f- a friend that I talk to all the time about chess. He does much better than I do against stronger players, and he's even beaten masters. But he's, you know, uh, and and I rarely do. But I'm very consistent, and I don't lose very often to lower rated players because I I think it's because of sort of my style. Of, of chess where I play positional solid chess and he's like um I guess from what I can tell it's sort of like a David low level David Pruis versus Jesse Cry <laughs> <laughs> kind of approach you know <laughs> um I remember that funny story that you they were telling in one of the podcasts I thought was really funny and Jesse Cry was saying saying let him let him die let him kill himself <laughs> 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 and David Pruis is sort of trying to continue the attack. And I think that does that that works really well, right? When you're when you're playing higher rated players. Well, why give lower rated players any kind of chances? And um and uh and that and that's you know going back to, to, to Boris, like and he, he would tell me like um he had really hard time playing Karpov. Even though he played a beautiful, you know, played some beautiful games against him. One of the first games that we did was a Karpov game that was published in Chess Life, actually. And that's why, that's how we ended up writing the first book, um, was going over that game. And um, he had a much, much harder time playing Karpov. He said Karpov was just brutal and just, you know, just constantly sort of, you know, what just sort of taking your ideas out of the position, you know, and, and uh, whereas Kasparov was like, you know, he wanted to fight. And Mm -hmm. uh, so that, you know, that allowed chances, you know, and uh, so it's a kind of a different, different kind of experience. So do you think that's more related to like chess style or anything with the actual players uh, like psychology? Or even with like the player's um, interpersonal relationship. What do you mean? Well, like maybe, you know, these guys know each other and they develop some kind of um, dynamic, right? Oh. And so you might fear one player, but not another player. And, you know, their chest strength might be very, very similar. Oh, oh, oh. Um, yeah, I would say that 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 that's more... Um... That's more chess, but I know that that in in our chapter on on reciprocal thinking, I remember um, talking a lot about um, um, getting to know the uh, other player, and he talked about how in the the Kasparov Karpov match, I guess it was the first match, where Kasparov kind of switches gears at some point, you know, and they they kind of start, he starts playing Queen's Gambit declines or something. Mm-hmm. I don't, don't remember. I don't, didn't study all the 47 games or whatever, but, but uh, yeah. And, 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 and he talks about how, you know, they, that, but in the, in the world championship level preparation, like you're really, really kind of getting into the mind of your opponent, you know, and, um, well, that's just something that, you know, mere mortals don't have the chance to do, you know, but, but anyway, yeah. So I, I think that that's, um, that's kind of interesting, uh, how to, uh, 
you know appreciate those types of factors when you're when you're playing right um so yeah you have a chapter that's called reciprocal understanding is that related to um like mutual blindness like when both players kind of miss the same thing uh, about a position Do you know what I mean? Like sometimes. Yeah, you're... yeah, right. You they they blunder and you don't see the blunder and yeah, we do have a, a thing about that, but I I don't remember that so well. I think the reciprocal part was more about understanding the opponent's mindset. There's a lot of that, you know. There there's there's um you know destroying your opponent's thinking process, mm -hmm. it, you know, in the in 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 it that um. There's so many things in this in the book where I, that I can connect to specific games of my own. It's just interesting because I can't really say that for the lessons with the Grandmaster series. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my, my I got a lot better for sure. I went from like 1500 to 2000, like just in the period of writing those books, but. Um, but I have specific specific games when I was doing the analyzing the chess mind where I was like, oh, Rook fires back. You know, like he missed something because my Rook is going to come back and he didn't, you know, that's in the perception chapter, you know, or destroying the thinking process of your opponent. I was playing this game and I was completely lost. I was going to get made it just completely lost. And I sacked a piece for two connected past pawns on the sixth, sixth rank, I was still completely lost. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but it created a whole, like, a situation that my right. opponent could not handle. And I was, like, flabbergasted. I I did. I was like, you're still completely winning. I still should, should still get mated. I don't know why you're not doing that. But he just totally fell apart, right. you know, and uh, started, like, defending against my past pawns. And all of a sudden, I'm, you know, winning. And so, the, I mean, there was like some very specific games um, where, you know, where, where stuff like that happens. Like in the in another game I played, um, I, I had just blundered the exchange and and I was like and he was lower rated than me and by maybe 100 points or something at the time. I can't remember exactly, but. I was really, I talk about it in the chess improvement uh, chapter at the end of the book. And I was really kicking myself. I was really like, just why, you idiot. I mean, what, you stupid <laughs> what, yeah. you moron. Like, how could you, you know, now what are you going to do? You dumb, you know, piece of doo-doo. Like, like that, that really, I was so upset. And I was just sitting there devastated. I was like, okay. So what am I going to do? And then my, but my opponent stopped, you know, started thinking. I don't know why, but they just, they just started thinking. And maybe but now that's the flip side on his side. You know, it was like losing winning positions. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? It's like right. losing losing the thread. You know, I don't know how to continue. Um, and I remember thinking, and he thought for 20 minutes. And I remember that in each of these segments my assessment of the position improved it was like five minutes i was like i was the worst chess player in the history of the universe i need to retire i don't want to ever see chess again and then there was like the next five, five minutes i was like wait a minute maybe it's not so terrible and then the, the next five minutes i was like look at that wait a second i've got the bishop pair i've got diagonals blah, you know what i mean and all and by the, the the fourth five minute segment i was formulating a plan and i thought i was perfectly fine it turned out according to the computer later on that it was zero zero and mm -hmm. uh, i had come to that but only after my opponent allowed me to think and kind of get myself out of that depressive thinking which is what, what I talk a lot about in the, the final chapter of the book and how depressive thinking, as you can hear, like this negative self-talk just went crazy, you know, and uh, how do you, you know, what do you do about that? So I talk a lot in yeah. that chapter about how to, how to deal with that. Yeah. I mean, how, uh, how do you deal with that? <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's tough, especially like when you have a good position, you make one mistake, you get upset. 
your position might still be totally fine. You might still have an advantage, but right. maybe not as big as before. But it's a really common scenario when players, they just start uh, sliding. Um, so, yeah, there's this common saying, like, mistakes come in pairs. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I imagine the first step is to kind of notice when it happens. But, you know, beyond that, like, what can you can you really do? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I treat that the, the way I treat cognitive distortions in my practice. I do a lot of this with depressed patients all the time. And they, you know, they, um, you know, th- this is depressed people walk around the world in that mindset, you know, and, and it's, um, it's a, um, you know, uh, the, you know, the, the idea is, is that when you're depressed, when you're thinking in a, in a kind of negative way, only negative things are going to get in, you know, your perceptual experience, the experience of what's happening in the world is going to be colored by your um, negative you know thinking and so positive experiences positive possibilities positive ideas are going to kind of bounce off you um whereas negative uh, experiences are going to get you know attached or you're going to attach onto them as as hey look you know more evidence that i'm a schmuck you know that kind of that kind of thing and um so when when in there are different types of treatments for, you know, depression and all these different things that I work with in my practice. But um, one of the uh, important tools that I use are these cognitive um, techniques from cognitive behavioral therapy. And one of them is um, using an automatic thought record for um, understanding your thinking. And so what we're, what I teach my patients all the time is, um, when you notice a dip in your mood, right, ask yourself what just went through my mind, right? And then you need to, so for example, I notice a dip in my mood, I'm feeling terrible. What just went through my mind? I'm an idiot. I'm a complete total schmuck for throwing, you know, throwing this game, blundering this piece. And then it's time to challenge the distortion, right? Because clearly I'm not an idiot, <laughs> I hope, <laughs> right? And so it's time to challenge that that kind of thing and to do that um, thoroughly. So I might take a few minutes, you know, you know, in a in a chess game. I I, I did it in this in this uh, in in that game that I was telling you about. I might take a few minutes in my mind and and say, okay, well, let's challenge that belief. Am I really an idiot? What would I tell a friend? You know, if I would, what would if a friend asked me the same thing? I would say something, you know, I wouldn't be telling them that they were schmucks and idiots and they should jump off a bridge. I would be saying something like, you know, well, maybe it's not so bad. Can you save the position? Can you, you know, do this or that, right? Mm-hmm. You're, you're you're not an idiot. You know a lot of stuff. Do you have resources? Maybe you can drag them into an endgame and swindle them in, in some theoretical endgame or whatever. Um, so you, you challenge the thought. And then when you're done challenging the thought, you re-rate the, the emotion. So the whole five column, it's called a five column thought record. You start with the situation, then you then you rate the, the intensity of the feeling, and then you write down the cognitive distortion, then you challenge the distortion, and then you re-rate the intensity of the emotion. And you, if you're doing them well, properly, thoroughly, then you're going to see, hopefully, a, a, a change in how you're feeling. Right. And you might have been at a 70, for example, from a zero to 100. Right. With 100 being the most depressed and miserable you've ever been and 100 being, you know, nothing. Then you might go from a 70 down to a 20. And when you're down at 20, you you, you freed up your mind a little bit to think. And that's what happened in that that specific game uh, that I was telling you about. Like the first five minutes, had he just moved? <laughs> I would have been done for because he just made a move and I would have just been like, oh, you know, and I would have just played some stupid move. But he let me think for 20 minutes. And I did this whole thing while I was, you know, while he was letting while he was thinking. And That's so uh, interesting. I, was able, I was able to kind of work on that. Yeah, definitely. It definitely makes sense that um, maybe one of the best things you can do is just take a couple minutes to mm-hmm. reset because it can really improve your mood for the rest of your game. And in many cases, that just leads to you 
playing better. Um, like, well, it's, you know, there's this effect when you when you know it's a puzzle, you know there's a solution, kind of a lot more likely to find it uh, than when you don't. And I feel like there's a negative effect as well. If you've, like, given up on the game and there's going to be a, a solution or some swindle, like, you, you've got no chance of finding it if you're just kind of, like, in a depleted mood. So right. um, it's actually one thing I, I try to do myself, but yeah, I'm, I'm not great at it, but, like, I, if when I get into really difficult situations, I'm just like, okay, I'm I'm probably lost completely, and I'm probably going to be lost for the rest of the game. But if at any mm. moment I get any chance, you know, I'm going to feel even more upset if I don't uh, capitalize on it. So I need to like really make sure. And then, mm. yeah, sometimes I'll get a chance. You know, maybe I, I can swindle it. Uh, sometimes I won't, but at least I have like the feeling like you know I I did my best. I, I tried the hardest that I could, which I think mm -hmm. is um, which I think is important. Stop.